today we're going to be discussing how believers can open up the floodgates of grace and achieve the things that the Messiah wants us to achieve in our lives. Um, to start out with, I want to read a passage from Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 14, this is a fairly well-known uh, line here. Uh, Paul says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Now, again, dominion means like having power or authority over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, now, we're going to kind of unpack that as we move forward here. But before we do, I want to share a vision that, uh, or whatever you want to call it, that an old pastor of ours had many years ago. When you were first getting into the ministry back out in uh, the Seattle area in the uh, late 80s, uh, we were ministering to a lot of people, getting them set free from oppression, things of that nature. And um, the, um, the pastor there at one point said that the Lord had showed him an image. And the image was this beautiful stream, and there was like this, some kind of a, a log or something that had fallen in the stream and had dammed up the river. It wasn't like something the beavers did, it was just some kind of a log that was, that was preventing the river from flowing. And he said he felt that was an illustration of what was keeping the blessings from flowing in the lives of believers. And, um, you know, we have to acknowledge this. I mean, in spite of how we like to kind of present ourselves, see ourselves, and even as we go to church or whatever, uh, many believers do struggle. You know, we like to say, oh, well, you know, all you got to do is accept Christ, quote unquote, and everything will be a bed of roses. But we know that's not really true. In spite of their best efforts, many believers do struggle. So today we're going to uh, look at two major reasons why this may be happening. <sighs> Things like forgiving us, forgiving those who have hurt us are essential. And we're going to discuss this at great length in a moment. But the question becomes, where do we get the ability to live the way the Messiah wants us to live? Now, it's interesting because in Philippians 4.13 the Apostle Paul says he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Many interpret this to mean that we can do mighty exploits or mighty miracles or whatever the case might be. And you hear this preached a lot. And of course, that is true. However, there's an old saying that a text without a context is a pretext. You need to look at the whole context of the passage. And you'll notice there in the context, and I won't take the time to read the whole thing, but you can look at it yourself, Paul is talking about being able to endure persecution. He's talking about being able to endure torture and imprisonment, and also to be wealthy, because even wealth has its own, you know, trials, its own temptations, although most of us, you know, would like to experience that. But, you know, the point is, is that he is saying he can do anything through Yeshua, Jesus, who strengthens him. Now, in the past, believers, I believe, and especially the last 50 years or so, have been taught a very sloppy view of grace. You'll often hear preachers say, you know, well, bless God, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And of course, they're drawing from the passage up there that I quoted at the beginning uh, from Romans 6. But we might well ask, what are the fruits of this kind of teaching, because it says in Matthew 7.20 that by their fruits shall you know them. Well, we know what's going on in the church today. Uh, frankly, it's lost its effectiveness. It's become a joke. Uh, we have adultery, infidelity, uh, divorce rates that are absolutely no different from those among people that are, you know, secular people, loss of respect for the Bible, lots of emotional and mental problems, uh, Believe it or not, according to polls, most uh, most uh, Christians are on just as many, you know, antidepressants, uh, anti-anxiety drugs, all these different pills, as are people that are not involved in the church. So the funny thing is, instead of the church turning the world upside down, as happened in Acts seventeen six, instead the world has turned the church upside down. Now here's the problem. I have nothing against grace. In fact, you're going to find out the whole essence of this talk is about grace. But grace is not the lubricant whereby we can just barely slide under the gates of heaven. 
It's, it's not like that. It's not intended to let us just squeak by. Grace is power. And if you don't believe me, read 2 Corinthians 12, 9 or Ephesians 3, 7. Uh, somehow we have this idea that grace is something wimpy. You know, I mean, maybe it's we have the word gracious and we think of gracious people as being kind of nice and sweet and all that, but not really very, you know, dare I use the word macho. The idea is conveyed that at best grace is like a get out of jail free card when we sin. And with it, we can barely squeak by. Well, that is not the nature of grace. The word in both of those passages above, in 2 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 3, in Greek is dunamis, for power. And that's where we get our word in the English, dynamite. And there is nothing wimpy about dynamite. You can blow up the side of a mountain with it. Now, the funny thing is, it says in Romans 8.37 that in all these things, after listing a bunch of trials, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, that's superlative. I mean, it'd be great just to be a conqueror, you know, in whatever category, whether it's being an athlete or whether it's being in the world of finance or, or whatever. But to be more than a conqueror, that would be awesome. It would be absolutely extraordinary to be more than a conqueror. And that's the promise that grace carries with it. It gives us the power to overcome temptation. It gives us the power to walk in victory in our lives, no matter what the circumstances. Have you just lost your job? Have you gotten sick? Uh, grace allows us to walk in a more than conqueror mode. It helps you remember that you're not your job. You're not your sickness. And so many people, they get, they get into that modality of thinking and they, they just wallow in it. They have what we used to call a pity party. And they forget who they are in Messiah. You're not your sickness or whatever challenges life brings you. You are more than a conqueror. Now, Yeshua, Jesus, provides us the way to have victory. In his Sermon on the Mount, which is you know, one of his most famous teachings, he raised the bar. He took the bar beyond the Old Testament, if you will. He said in Matthew 5, 17 through 18, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, and I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from law till all be fulfilled. Now, we understand that. And we understand that's why we know we still have the Bible today as the Word of God because heaven and earth are obviously still here, so this is still here. Now, he also said, and this is what I mean by raising the bar, he looked at around at, at the Pharisees that were part of the culture then, you know, and he said, you have heard it said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Another passage, very near that, in Matthew 25, 27 to 28, he says this. Again, comparing the old Torah, the old way of looking at it, to his raising the bar. He says, You have heard it said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh at a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. See, he's teaching us here that righteousness is not just a matter of externals, which is what the Pharisees were doing. It's a matter of the heart. And, you know, and most people think of the Pharisees as the ultimate example of legalistic perfection. You know, they, they tithe every little bit of mint and cumin and all this stuff. But yet in the same chapter in Matthew 5.20, Yeshua taught, For I say unto you, except your righteousness or exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you might ask, how is this possible? I mean, you know, um, we, we all struggle with sin in our lives. Anybody who says they don't is basically deceiving themselves. Here is the trick. It is by tapping the awesome power of grace. 
See, grace enables us to escape living under the law by helping us to live over the law. Instead of settling for just barely making the grade, we can be more than conquerors. Think of it this way. You know, if you think of, of the law as being like the baseline, you know, that's, that's you know, what is expected. And, and we think, oh, we're doing real good if we can just get up to that. But Yeshua is saying no. He says you need to, you can rise above this and I'll help you. You can go, you can go beyond the normal to excellence. You can go beyond the normal to being an extraordinary disciple. And that's through grace. Grace empowers us. Grace lifts us up. Grace flows through our veins like dynamite and enables us to do the things we need to do. But why do believers under struggle so much with this understanding of grace? They don't seem to get it. I mean, you know, and part of that is because they, they've not heard it preached that much. There are many reasons for this. The overarching concern is that there is sin in the camp, as it says in Deuteronomy 7. Uh, Unfortunately, there's a lot of goofy doctrine in the church today. There's a lot of, of bad teaching, and there's a lot of sin. Because, of course, there's an old saying, the pew can't rise any higher than the pulpit. And if the, the pastors are in sin, it's very hard to be under that kind of leadership, that kind of headship, and, and do well. So, as Paul warned nearly 2,000 years ago, he said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. I believe that while some Christians do commit big sins, unfortunately, and, you know, some of them <clears throat> make the nightly news, the ones that are more pernicious, more prevalent, and more deadly are the ones that good-hearted people commit. These are the sins that take the steam out of our Christian walk, that rob us of our victory in our lives. It is these sins we're going to be discussing in this talk. The sad thing is, in some cases, believers will not even have realized these sins are sin. Now, we're going to look at Matthew 18, 23-35. This is one of the more famous parables. Uh, Yeshua says this, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. Now, I know you've probably heard this preach, but just in case you haven't, realize that's an enormous amount of money. It's like today it would be like millions of dollars. But for as much as he, the servant, had not to pay, his Lord commanded that he be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. That's how things were done back then. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him his debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now realize, that's like a pittance compared to what the Lord just forgave him. Uh, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat and said, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down on his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that this was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Uh, <clears throat> and then the Lord, after that, called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredst me. Shouldst thou not also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Now notice this. And the Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now, think about that for a minute. We all understand we're supposed to give, I mean, forgive. I mean, the most famous passage probably in the entire Bible is the, the Lord's Prayer, where it says, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But the funny thing is, a lot of people struggle with it. 
Uh, and there are two levels of mystery we need to open up about forgiveness. Most people think of forgiveness as a New Testament concept. Uh, they kind of have this idea that the Almighty in the Old Testament is this real mean, you know, very strict, stern taskmaster and all that. And in the New Testament, all of a sudden, it's like he's all nice and like cuddly. Actually, that isn't true. The word forgive appears 27 times in the Hebrew Scriptures, 21 times in the New Testament. Interestingly, forgiveness only appears one time in the Hebrew Bible, appears six times in the New Testament. In the Bible, it is only used in relation to Yahweh, the Almighty. It is never mentioned as relation to something people do. Now, it's interesting, too. There's a, there's a hermeneutical uh, interpretation rule, a Bible interpretation, that says, talks about the law of first mention. And the idea is that when the first time a word is used, that word kind of is defined in the rest of the Bible. So the first time it is used, it is used of a godly man, Joseph, in Genesis 50. Now Joseph was, of course, the son of Jacob who was sold into slavery. We all know the story. And, and his brothers were the ones that basically sold him into slavery. And so here at the end of the, of, the, of the account, they discover he has become the second most powerful man in Egypt. And, you know... They say unto him, Forgive, I pray thee, the trespass of our brethren. That's uh, Genesis 50, 17. Uh, and of course, Joseph is a type of Christ because he is someone who went into bondage, who, who ended up saving an entire people, in fact, the entire probably Fertile Crescent region from, from starvation. So he's regarded by most Bible scholars as a very, uh, a very good example of Christ. Uh, now, for the word forgiveness... The first occurrence is in Psalm 130, verse 4. With thee is forgiveness, that thou mayest be feared. Now this is a celebrated out of the depth psalm, uh, which has been used for many centuries as a cry for help or deliverance. The bottom line is that being forgiven by the Almighty means that our gratitude and humility should keep us from repeating the same sin. So the first mystery of forgiveness is that we being able to accept that we are indeed forgiven. As a people, we tend to carry around a lot of guilt and shame. Some, some, since we are so hard on others, we have a hard time that we ourselves are forgiven by Yeshua. Oddly enough, the word guilt only appears twice in the entire Bible. How many of you knew that? And in both times, it's in Deuteronomy, and in both times, it's italicized in the authorized version. Now, those of you that are maybe deeper students of the Bible might know what that means. When the King James translators were going through the Hebrew and the Greek, and they felt there was a need to clarify something that wasn't explicitly in the text, they would put it in, but they would put it in italics so that people would know that this word wasn't in the Hebrew or wasn't in the Greek. And so one could truthfully say that ultimately the word guilt does not appear in the Bible. Now, there is the phrase blood guiltiness that's used in the 51st Psalm. And of course, that is the famous penitential psalm of the Bible. And in the context, it refers to the fact that King David had first committed adultery and then secondly ordered the murder of the man whose wife he had slept with, who was a soldier under his command. So that was his guilt for having shed innocent blood. Now, the other word that we're going to talk about briefly is shame. Shame shows up 99 times in the Bible. By the law of first mention, which is Exodus um, pardon me, 32, 25, it's used in the context of when Moses catches the Israelites worshiping a golden calf. And it, 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 he talks about how they had made themselves naked before their enemies. Uh, it seems as though shame in the Bible is more about how other people perceive you. Thus, guilt is evidently more internal. Shame is derived about how others perceive you, or at least how you think others perceive you. And it's interesting. Um, for many years, I worked as a counselor, uh, you know, and, and in that context, from the secular standpoint, psychologists say, that guilt is what you feel when you think you've done something wrong. 
Shame is what you are made to feel that you are wrong. You see the distinction there? The irony of it is, according to the Word of God, we are fundamentally broken. You know, uh, Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. And, and going down a little bit, there is no fear of God before their eyes, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And of course, that's a famous verse that we all use in terms of evangelizing people. Another one, though, that's also interesting is from Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So this is a very candid and un unblinking view of humanity. No other holy book, not, not the Quran, not the Book of Mormon, not the Rig Veda, gives us this clear and unvarnished view of human nature. Unlike modern psychology, the Bible tells us vividly that within us something is fundamentally wrong. And who can really deny this? All you have to do is look at a two-year-old kid, you know, I mean, they can be the most rebellious little whatever you want to call them you can imagine. You tell them, don't stick your finger in the light socket. And, you know, that's what they do. You know, and it's funny. I remember many years ago I saw a bumper sticker, and it had a picture of Christ on the cross, and it said, if I'm okay and you're okay, then explain this. So, thankfully, this bleak state of humanity has offered a solution. In Romans 8, 1, we're told, Now there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And of course, he already taught that passage about uh, the conquerors, that we are more than conquerors. So, there is a way out. The Bible truth is that, yeah, we have a lot of guilt and shame to work about, but the solution is accepting the work of Calvary into our lives. The problem is, is that many of, these, many of us know these truths intellectually up here, but we don't know them in our heart. And Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that our hearts can be deceitful and desperately wicked, and the only one who can plumb the depths of those things is the Almighty. And it, it is funny because, you know, a lot of people will acknowledge it's one thing to know something up here, but this 18-inch journey from here down to here is sometimes the hardest journey the hardest pilgrimage any of us will make in our lives. Even though we have been born again, we cannot truly believe that he has forgiven us. And this is because many of us have what is called a wounded spirit. It says in Proverbs 18, 14, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. In other words, if you're, if you're physically sick, but you have a strong spirit, you can get through it. But the rest of the verse says, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? If your spirit is wounded, then it's like someone let the air out of your tires. You can't go anywhere on an emotional or spiritual level. And in Psalm 109.22 we read, But I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. And this isn't talking about a physical wound. This is talking about an emotional or a spiritual wound. Often we do not acknowledge this either because we're not aware of it or because our culture, even church culture, does not encourage us. Many are taught, as I mentioned earlier, that once you're saved, everything's a bed of roses, you know. Everybody is supposed to be positive and give a positive confession. You come to church and you're like this and you go, oh, hallelujah, bless God, I'm so great, you know, and everybody says, how are you doing, brother? Oh, I'm just doing great. When inside, your heart is cracking. We need to be honest and acknowledge that our feet are still bound up in the grave clothes of our old lives. And I, I've used the metaphor in our book, Blood on the Doorpost and elsewhere, about how when Yeshua raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he walks out of the tomb, and then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, now loose him and let him go, because he still had his grave clothes around him, which kept him from walking. And that's how we are. We are raised up to a new life in Messiah, but we still are bound with the ceremonies of our old life. 
Sometimes it is our inability to appropriate the love of Abba Father that stands in our way. And, you know, it says in Romans 8, 15, we have not received the spirit of bondage. See, the grave clothes that bind us. Again, to fear, but we receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. And in many cases, Christians have trouble appropriating that precious truth that we have a heavenly Father and that he loves us, even if maybe our earthly father wasn't the greatest. Because let's face it, none of us had a perfect father, you know. And some of us had profoundly imperfect fathers. But that doesn't matter. We have a heavenly father. Now, sometimes a wounded spirit keeps us from feeling accepted in the beloved, as it says in Ephesians 1.6. Um, I've counseled so many people, and we, we've prayed for probably close to 2,000 people to be set free and or emotionally healed over the years. And people tell me, I don't feel loved. I don't feel like I'm saved. I don't feel forgiven. Sometimes we don't even feel capable of loving. We feel emotionally dead inside. And then there's people who have what we call the leaky bucket syndrome. And we all know people like this. These are people you can just love and love and love and give them all this unconditional love. Just shower them with love, and it's never enough. It's like you're pouring water into a leaky bucket. And, and they'll turn around and they'll say, Nobody loves me. You know, my husband doesn't love me. My family doesn't love me. Whatever. And that's because they can't hold love. Because metaphorically speaking, their heart is so wounded, it cannot hold the love they're receiving. And see, all this makes it seem like salvation is a lie. The devil cannot take our salvation, but he can try to make our lives so miserable that we're not an effective witness. And I have a lot of people, again, call me on the phone or email me or, or whatever, and they'll say, well, I want to go out and talk about Yeshua with other people, but I feel like I'm such a sad sack. I feel like I'm such a mess myself. I mean, I'm not a very good advertisement for him, you know. In fact, I remember a good friend of mine, a preacher, Jim Spencer, I asked him once, what, you know how you'll see a lot of Christians, they'll have like a little fish bumper sticker or a little thing tacked on the rear of their car. And I asked him, why don't you have one of those? And he says, he says, because I don't want Jesus to, uh, to have to live down my driving. <laughs> and that's how a lot of these Christians feel. They feel like their lives are a mess, so why should they go out and talk to people? Now, the solution to this is provided by heaven. Number one, liberation or deliverance, as it's commonly known. We prefer to call it liberation. Prayer for healing the wounded spirit. Prayer and healing for restoring the soul and then the daily application of the blood of the Lamb. Now, it's funny, probably one of the most famous passages in the entire Bible is the 23rd Psalm. And in the third verse of that Psalm, it says, He restoreth my soul. And yet many Christians don't know that God will do that. They don't even know that God can do that. And that He can restore the soul. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you restore a house, what does that mean? It means you bring the house back like some beautiful old homes, you know, where it's all run down or whatever, and they, they find out what the right paint is that they is, used 100 years ago, and they, they make it back the way it was, some old Victorian house or whatever. And that's what God can do for you. But you have to let him. You have to trust him with your feelings. Now, the other thing we have to do is we have to get in the groove Old grooves, if you will, are left in our soul by our old life, our old experiences. And if we've had some bad experiences in our lives, and hey, who hasn't? That means that we have to get rid of those grooves and get new grooves. And the funny thing is, neurologists, people that study the brain biologically will tell you the same thing. They will say that we have in our brain neural pathways. Neurons are the, the nerve cells of the brain. And that when things happen, when we like say, just an example, we learn to play the piano, those neurons grow networks that, that govern all of the movements of our, of our hands and even the fact that our eyes can look and understand music. That's fine. But on the other hand, if we have learned to be ashamed or if we have learned that we are worthless, if that is the message that's been given us by people in authority over us, then that neural network has been built. 
What they also tell us, though, and see, here's the hope, is that you can build new neural networks in your brain, new grooves, if you will, and those old grooves that are full of shame and bitterness and whatever, that if you don't use them, they'll gradually wither up and break apart. So there is hope, even totally ignoring the miracle power of the Holy Spirit. Now here's the second mystery of forgiveness. The famous Lord's Prayer passage I've already quoted, to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to forgive. Sometimes we cannot really begin to forgive the deep hurts in our lives until we first begin to feel forgiven ourselves. So, And it's like the old saying, you can't give away what you don't have. We need to know and feel that we are forgiven. Then we can begin to act out of the Holy Spirit rather than out of our own feelings. Because our own feelings are pretty small. Now, we've all heard stories, the most famous one recently, uh, of people who were forgiving others under extraordinary circumstances. The one I was alluding to uh, a couple, three years ago, we had this horrible thing that happened where this um, Amish school was shot up and several children were killed. And yet, if you've seen the news, you know the Amish community, they not only forgave the man who did it, and of course he took his own life, uh, they also actually raised money to help out the man's widow and his children, who of course were innocent. Now, that's an extraordinary act of forgiveness. A lot of people wouldn't be able to do that. But in Christ, to the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. Conversely, our inability to forgive may mean that there are parts of your life, parts of your heart, that have not been fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Now, it's only through cultivating the fruits of and qualities of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we can be able to forgive. Because, see, it is a key quality of Yahweh God to forgive. In Psalm 86, 5, it says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. And of course, we know that even Yeshua, when he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Part of the divine nature, the Hebrew word is chesed. It means loving kindness and mercy. And we are supposed to be partakers of that divine nature if we are born again. 2 Peter 1, 4 says, Whereby he has given us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So it is through that nature and only through that nature that we have the power to forgive. Now, most Christians have heard of Corey Ten Boom. She was a, she's now gone home to be with the Lord, but she was a famous survivor of the death camps in, in Nazi Germany. She was part of a Christian family that hid um, Jewish refugees from the Nazis, I believe it was in Holland. And uh, when she was caught, she was thrown in prison and suffered many horrible things. But later on, she became quite a celebrity, and they made both a book and a film out of her story. It was called The Hiding Place. In any event, at one point, many years later, she was out somewhere speaking, and this elderly gentleman came up to her. And he said, do you remember me, Fraulein? And she says, I'm sorry, I don't. And he says, I was one of the concentration camp guards that tormented you. And she kind of stiffened up because she gradually recognized him. It was like, you know, 40 years later or something. And he said, can you forgive me? And she said it took about five or 10 seconds, but then all of a sudden it was like something in her heart just like broke. And she took his hand and hugged him and said, yes, I forgive you. Now again, that kind of miracle is only happen, is only possible through Christ. There's, a, there's the carrot and the stick thing going on here because the blessings of forgiveness are so profound. We're going to talk about that a little more in a minute. But there's also the stick, the consequences of unforgiveness. Again, right after the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, Yeshua says, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will the Father forgive your trespasses. That thought alone should be terrifying enough for most people. Beyond that, many people fail to realize that forgiving others can be incredibly liberating. When you forgive, it takes an enormous burden off of you. 
it stops you from playing God. And let's face it, that's a pretty big job. Think about it. You know, you need to remember Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When you fail to forgive, you are refusing to let someone off the hook for your earthly ideas of vengeance. That means you think your merely human ideas of justice are better than the Almighty's. Is that presumptuous or what? Not only that, when you fail to forgive, you are spurning part of the divine nature, and it spiritually constipates you. Sorry to use that metaphor, but it's very apt. Nothing can flow. None of the gifts and the callings of the Holy Spirit can really flow. When you fail to forgive, you keep allowing the offending person to hurt you over and over and over again. We need to remember that story of Matthew 18, which we just read, about how that if you don't forgive, you will be turned over the tormentors. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a pretty scary thing in practice. It can mean emotional torment. It can mean demonic torment. It can mean spiritual torment. It can even mean physical torment, disease, cancer, ulcers, etc. It says in Proverbs eleven seventeen, The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. And we know this, even, even physiologically. Um, they've done studies in what is called psychosomatic medicine, and that many times people that are bitter, that are unforgiving, they have ulcers, they develop cancer, all kinds of things. Uh, let's be blunt here. A person who thinks he knows more than Yahweh God about judgment and forgiveness is a blank fool. And it says in Ecclesiastes 4, 5, the fool foldeth his hands together and eateth his own flesh. Think of that. So many people who harbor unforgiveness in their hearts end up emotionally hard and twisted. And you see, the healing waters of the Holy Spirit cannot get through them. Um, whatever people have done to us, we need to remember that we too are sinners. And that we, like the, like the servant in the parable that I just read at the beginning here, that we have amassed an enormous debt of sin to our Heavenly Father, and He has forgiven it if we are born again. So we can turn around and we can forgive these people that have done relatively little to us by comparison, or even not so little. If we have been forgiven, then we must know that the hurts that another has dealt us are nothing compared to the hurts that we have dealt to the Almighty. Remember the cross. Now you might say to me, Preacher, this person has hurt me over and over again. I mean, and, and how about the people who are victims of child sexual abuse? How about women who have been victims of spousal abuse, domestic violence? Well, Yeshua says in Luke 17, 4, If ye trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Over and over again, in our counseling, we have seen people who are victims of awful, repeated trauma get amazing victory and relief just by forgiving their tormentor. Not only does it mean that you have to, now this doesn't mean you have to feel wonderful about this person. You don't have to feel all warm and fuzzy and invite them to spend a week at the beach with you. Now, obviously, if this person is a criminal, that doesn't mean you move back in with them. If they're violent, whatever. But it means you're letting them off your hook so they can be the subject to the justice of the almighty judge of the universe. Think of it this way. We've all heard the term extradition. When you forgive someone, that means you are allowing them to be extradited out of this human kingdom into the realm of the divine judgment of God. Besides, remember, you have, have you not hurt Yeshua over and over again with your sinning? Think about it. Now remember, Yeshua is supposed to be Lord over all of our we understand this is a process. It takes some time. But if we are keeping this little part of our hearts away from him, it means there is a place where the devil has planted his little black pirate flag that the Holy Spirit cannot come. 
It is a small place where the cross of Messiah cannot stand. Now, this is serious. Think about it. This is the only sin that is mentioned in the Lord's Prayer. It doesn't say if we're adulterers, we won't be forgiven. It doesn't say if we are murderers, we won't be forgiven. It doesn't say if we're divorced, we won't be forgiven. It says if we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. Speaking of murder, we understand that sometimes unforgiveness for someone is rooted in the fact that we just hate their guts. We hear stories of feuds, of, of families that are bitterly divided. Um, and there's hatred there. Perhaps you have every excuse me, reason to hate them, but that's not really the point. This is one of those places, like the Sermon on the Mount, where you've taken the commands of the Torah into something deeper. In 1 John 3, 14 and 15, it says, We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, I know this is a hard word. I'm not trying to bring anyone under condemnation because that is not of the Spirit. But we need to realize this is pretty serious stuff. We may be living an exemplary scriptural life in any other regard. But this sin can lay on our back like a sack of lead weights. And please, remember the tormentors. How can you have real peace when you are lugging around all this stuff? Just to clarify something, though. Emotion, uh, forgiveness is not an emotion. It's an act of the will. People think, oh, I think of this person, my heart gets all kind of knotted up. Well, that's okay. If somebody raped you, if somebody beat you up, if somebody abused you as a child, you know, you're not expected to feel wonderful towards them. That's, that's okay. That's beyond superhuman. It has it is been in fact said that the Almighty is the only one who can forgive and forget. We can't do that. But it does mean that by an act of will, you must choose to put aside all anger, hatred, and bitterness about them. In Galatians 5, 9 through, 19 through 20, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. And then finally in Hebrews 12, 15, it says, Looking diligently... Lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up among you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, this root of bitterness, but I just want to go back for a minute. No believer, no follower of Messiah should ever be guilty of hating anyone. I don't care what the excuse might be. That just is not possible, as John tells us. Hatred is the same as murder. And Yeshua said the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. And these are parts of the work of the flesh. So we are to love our enemies, do good to those who persecute us, pray for those who despitefully use us. And you say, well, preacher, that's hard. Yes, but through grace, we are more than conquerors, and we can do it. Understand this, it's almost impossible for unforgiveness to ride without hatred, wrath, and strife being in the saddle with him. Now think of this. Think of these four things as your own personal four horsemen of the apocalypse. These sins are grouped with other works of the flesh there in Galatians, which are pretty nasty. And I will tell you that root of bitterness can cause more trouble in a person's life with their relationship to God, their relationship to their families, their relationship with themselves. Believe me, this is powerful stuff. As James says in James 3, 11, Doth a fountain send forth the same place water, sweet water and bitter? The implication is no. Going down a few verses, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is shown in the peace of them that make peace. And remember, it says in the 
same passage in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. So this is what you need to be in your life. And I would really, as we bring this passage to part of our talk to a close and before I move on, I want to exhort you that if you have unforgiveness in your life, if you have people that, that you know you haven't forgiven. Maybe it's an abusive parent. Maybe it's an ex-spouse or whatever. You need to, to make a list. And again, this doesn't mean you have to feel wonderful towards them. But you need to pray and go before the Lord and say, Lord, for your sake and the sake of your commandments, I forgive this person for doing whatever. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah. So if you haven't done these things, you're going to keep running around with this big sack of lead weights on your back and you're not going to get the victory in Christ. I can promise you that. Because I'll tell you, this is so serious that we've had people come to us sometimes from far distances for being set free from uh, evil spirits or from emotional wounding or whatever. And they say, oh, I just can't forgive my father or I just can't forgive my ex-husband or whatever. We'll say, then we're sorry. We can't do anything else until you're willing to take that step. It blocks you that much. So please take this to heed. And now we're going to move onward to part two where we talk about the root of bitterness. Now in the second half of this, we're going to explore the issue of bitter roots more closely. And this is a, a part of um, the whole process of emotional healing, which is not well understood. And it can be a major stumbling box. So we're going to actually ex get into now the whole issue of what I call dark roots and withered souls. Now, a key part of the liberation process uh, involves emotional healing. Liberation takes care of our spiritual realm, the uh, infestation by evil spirits. Uh, most of us understand that the human being is comprised of a body and a soul and a spirit. However, what is left behind is the flesh. It cannot be cast out because it's us. It can only be healed. Key points to remember. When an evil spirit is cast out, it leaves a spiritual vacuum behind. Some people compare it to like if you drive a nail into the wall and then you remove the nail, there's still the hole. That's why we pray for the person immediately be filled with the Holy Spirit. We also pray, as I mentioned earlier, for the restoration of the soul as according to Psalm 23.3, but that's often enough, not enough. There are also strongholds. If you go in your Bible to 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, again, a fairly well-known passage, but we need to understand what this is saying. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, they're not part of the flesh, part of the body, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now notice that. The two things that are mainly mentioned here, actually three, strongholds, imaginations, and bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. In the, pardon me, into the obedience of Christ. So, what does all this mean? Well, strongholds, we all know what they are in the physical realm. They're a fort. They're a castle, something of that nature. But in terms of talking about people, they're fleshly constructs that exist in our soul or body. Uh, they are, if you will, forts that were once held by evil spirits. When it, it, it's kind of this way. I mean, when you, let's say you fall into a bad habit, which can happen to anybody. Let's just say, for an example, you get involved in gambling. You want to go to a, a casino or a gambling boat or whatever. We have a lot of those around here. And uh, you go, and at first you just do it a little bit, no big deal. But then you start going more. And there is a dynamic here. I used to counsel compulsive gamblers. And I know what this can be like. Uh, eventually, you start digging yourself deeper and you become addicted to it. And what that is in the spiritual realm is what is called the spirit of bondage. 
And that spirit of bondage can kind of tunnel into your soul, if you will, if you'll pardon the metaphor. And all of a sudden, it takes on a life of its own. Your addiction, whether it's gambling or shopping or drugs or alcohol, doesn't matter. And before you know it, there's this whole, if you will, stronghold that's been built up in your flesh. It's a practiced pattern of behavior. It's beyond a habit. It's, it's like a groove, like we spoke about in a few minutes ago. It's been worn into your soul. And it's very hard to get out of that groove. It's pretty darn deep. So, you know, there are all kinds of these. For example, uh, when these spirits are cast out, they leave behind the stronghold. It could be a stronghold of fear. It could be a stronghold of anger or bitterness. It could be a stronghold of unforgiveness, which we were just speaking of. Various addictive behaviors. Even physical and emotional problems can be strongholds. For example, we had one person who was very, very fearful, and they had good reason to be. They had, they'd had horrible trauma when they were a child. I won't go into all the details, but suffice it to say, this person lived in a constant state of fear. If you were a psychologist, you would say they were phobic. And it was so bad, they also suffered from heart failure. And, you know, like it says in the Bible, men's heart shall fail them for fear. So we prayed and we cast out the spirit of fear and we prayed for that stronghold to be healed, to be washed away. And the person was delivered from that compulsively phobic behavior and their heart actually got better over a period of a few weeks. They were completely healed of heart failure. That's a miracle, you know, hallelujah. The point is, is that that, that issue in, her, in the person's physical heart was a stronghold. And we've already alluded in earlier to some things like uh, ulcers and cancers, how they can be the result of unforgiveness or bitterness. Uh, here we have moved out of the realm of liberation or deliverance and into the process of further sanctification. Now that's a big word. What do we mean by sanctification? Well, it's, it's, um, it's basically rooted in the Latin word. It means to make a saint. And how many of you realize you're all saints? If you are a member of the body of Christ, if you are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of the Lamb, you are a saint. Saints aren't just, you know, dudes that have plaster statues. I mean, a saint is someone who is sanctified, who is set apart, and who is walking in the power of Christ. Now, note how in this passage in 2 Corinthians that I just read, we're told about imaginations, high things and thoughts which must be brought into obedience to Messiah. Now, the imagination. This is a key playground for the world, the flesh, and the devil. Just remember, just because evil spirits have been cast out doesn't mean they still can't whisper things in your ear. They can put thoughts and images in your head. And anybody who used to be involved in a sinful behavior will tell you that. I mean, whether it's you know, I used to, when I worked as an addictions counselor, I used to have alcoholics tell me, I can smell a bar a block away. <laughs> you know, I mean, all they need to do is get near something like that, and they're in big trouble. Um, high things. Well, what's that? High things relate to pride. Of course, we all know pride is the cardinal sin. Uh, all sins are rooted in pride because sin implies, I think I know what's best for me, even though it disagrees with the Bible. Thoughts are, of course, anything. It could be any kind of doubts, lust, resentment, bitterness, a host of things. And, and the funny thing is, and I don't know how anybody really figured this out, but in, in when I was getting my master's degree at Liberty University in counseling, they told me the average person thinks around 10,000 thoughts a day. Now think of that. Um, I don't even go over how they did that, how they figured that out. And they said most of these thoughts are the same. They don't change. We all have like tape loops playing around in our mind over and over and over again. And some of us, those tape loops aren't very nice. They had, oh, I'm a miserable, you know, whatever. I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm a failure, you know. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat dirt, you know, whatever the case might be. Uh, that's just one example. There are many. And these are thoughts which need to be dealt with because that isn't true. You are not a miserable piece of dirt. 
You are not a loser. None of those things are really true. These are all elements what the person needs to deal with. And notice what it says. And cast down. You can't cast them out because they're part of you. But you can cast them down. That's what happened to the Battle of Jericho. In the book of Joshua, the, the walls came a tumbling down, just like the old spiritual says. Now, a major problem with which believers struggle in this area is what the Bible calls bitter roots. I read this a few minutes ago, and I'm going to go through it again. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, in other words, being really careful here, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now notice how that goes there. It says the root of bitterness will spring up and trouble you, but thereby many, meaning those around you, your children, your spouse, whatever, many might be defiled. And of course, defiled, to defile something means to be smirched, to make it dirty, to make it less than what Yahweh God wants it to be. This is the core passage we're going to look at, but there are others. In Deuteronomy 29, 18, it says this, Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of the nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Now, gall is a kind of vinegar, and obviously that's, ugh, you know, most people don't want to just eat pure vinegar. Wormwood, which is Artemisia, is a highly bitter, toxic herb. We shall see here that this bitter root can come from idolatry, serving the gods of the nations. But that isn't the only reason. Isaiah 14, 29, the prophet there says this, Rejoice not, thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root, notice that, the serpent's root shall come a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now, um, that's some of that's kind of odd. You know, the, the word cockatrice there is a very poisonous, legendary lizard-like creature. It's sort of like a Gila monster. Its very bite can kill you, supposedly. Thus, this whole idea of the serpent's root is associated with reptiles and serpents which bite and inject venom into the person. Then there is a passage we quoted earlier in James 3.11. Doth, doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Sadly, this is the case for many believers. Many believers will go to church and they'll be all nice and, oh, bless the Lord, hallelujah, and shake hands and everything. And then they'll go home and they'll beat their wife. This is abominable. This is a profoundly evil sin. And, you know, parts of the lives are sweet, but deep down inside they feel bitterness. And there is an old saying, which I learned when I was working in the addictions field, which I think is, is true, and that is something very simple, four words. Hurt people hurt people. If you are beating your wife, yelling at your kids, whacking your kids around, being abusive to people under you at work, that is because you are acting out of your own bitterness, out of your own woundedness. You yourself probably are carrying around hurts which you may or may not be aware of. Okay, in Luke 3 verse 9, John the Baptist is talking here. And he is, the la we're told, the last and greatest of the prophets. And he says, and now also the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is what the Almighty wants us to do. He wants us to lay the axe to the root of the tree. Don't worry about what's up on the branches. See, if we have bitter roots, we cannot bear good fruit. Unfortunately, much of what is done in counseling, and that's why I left the counseling field to do this kind of work, uh, and even in many churches, involves picking the rotten fruit off the tree and throwing it away. This is only marginally helpful. You're dealing with superficial external stuff. Instead, we need to follow John the Baptist's advice and whack away at the very root. Then the bad fruit will stop. If you can turn those bitter roots into healthy roots then the fruit will follow naturally. 
You can't have the fruit without the root. That's why, and, and, I, and again, I don't mean to say I'm being down on Christians, but there's many Christians, you know, the charge you'll often hear from people that aren't members of a church, where, oh, Christians are hypocrites. You know, they talk like this, they, they talk a good fight, but then they go out and they do stuff that's not right. And, that, and sadly, that's true for a lot of people, and that's because they don't have the root, and so they can't have the fruit. And I, I, I explain it like this. I say, those people, it's kind of like, they're kind of like Christmas trees. Now you say, how is that, preacher? Well, think about it. A Christmas tree is whacked off at the root, you know, has no roots, and then people put baubles on it. And, you know, does that real fruit? I mean, I, I've seen many Christmas trees where they have fake plastic fruit, like fake little uh, apples or fake little whatever hanging on them. You can't pull one of those apples off the Christmas tree and bite into it and expect to get any nourishment out of it. And that's what these Christians are like. Because they have no root, they have to put out fake fruit. They have to put out, oh, this happy little smile, you know, or whatever, and, and pretend to act like, oh, I'm so holy. Well, no, you're not. If your roots are bitter, you can't be holy. All you can do is act. All you, And, you know... Unfortunately, there's a saying in the again in the recovery movement that is fake it till you make it. You can't really do that. You can't fake it till you make it until you deal with the internal problems. Number one, you may need to be saved, but number two, you may need to get rid of your bitter roots. Okay. Bitter roots, what are they? Well, they originate mainly from judgments. Notice that judgments we make about ourselves and others. This is tricky because most of us, even believers, are judgmental. In fact, this is the real irony. Most Christians are known for being judgmental. You know, I mean, we, it, it, it's like almost a cliche. Oh, you're so judgmental. That's why I don't like, you know, Baptists or whatever, Lutherans or Methodists. You're, you're also judgmental, you know. But the funny thing is, there's all these passages about not judging. I mean, like Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Judge not, Yeshua says. This is, again, the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not that ye be not judged. Notice this. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, shall be measured to you again. And again, Luke six thirty seven. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. That there's also this. Just, just you know, when things seem to be nice and clear. John 7, 24. Yeshua, again, says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, here's the problem. That seems to kind of contradict itself. But we know that Yeshua does not do that. I would submit to you that this conflict is more imagined than real. Remember, when two scriptures collide like this, we must, in humility, acknowledge the problem is with our understanding, not with the Bible. Remember, if you could understand God, you'd be God. In the passage in John, which the last one I read, says Yeshua says we must not judge according to outward appearance. But how else are we to judge somebody? We cannot know their heart except by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And that does happen, especially if you're a pastor, if you're a minister. Occasionally the Holy Spirit will show you something. You know, they will show you the thoughts. And we see that in, in, the, um, in the Bible as well, where many times either Yeshua or Paul or whoever would know what was in the heart of someone by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But most of the time that's not true. So therefore... Let me suggest that we exhort to know them by their fruits, Matthew 16 to 20. We are also told to discern. Now, this is a very key word, and that's in Mal and I, I don't have time to read all these, but in Malachi 3, 8, Matthew 16, 3, and Hebrews 5, 14, we are told to discern between good and evil. That's not to judge. That's to discern. Now, obviously, as solid believers, we need to be able to recognize evil and through the gifting of the Holy Spirit to discern it. And that's 1 Corinthians 12.10. Um, obviously, if, if you've got a friend who's into, you know, like, you know, kitty porn or he's into, you know, 
drugs or some other godforsaken thing, you need to know that discern that that's not right. You need to get away from that guy. You know, you know, the old saying, you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. You need to get away from him. If he's doing something criminal, obviously, you need to report him. That's discernment. That's for our own protection. Or if you're a parent, maybe, and you perceive that your young adolescent child is hanging out with the wrong crowd, you need to be able to discern that so you can offer godly counsel to your child. But there's a critical difference between discerning and knowing on the one hand and judging on the other. Remember Yeshua said this. And this is a passage many people forget about. He says in John 18, 15, and 16, Ye judge after the flesh. I, meaning the Lord, judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Yeshua said he judges no one except in some sort of union we can't even begin to understand about the Father, with the Father. If he will not judge alone, how can we presume to? Being judgmental can be a serious sort of bitter root. Now we're going to explore the different kinds of bitter root judgments, because this is where we can all fall into this trap. The first one, which may surprise you, is judging yourself. Unfortunately, believers do this a lot. This is partially because many legalistic churches lay a heavy burden <clears throat> on us. Now, don't let this teaching be such a burden. I am offering you this as counsel. I'm not saying if you don't do this, God will smite you or you're going to hell. If you don't do this, your life might become a living hell eventually. But that's just as a consequence of your, what you're doing inside of your heart but I'm not trying to lay a legalistic burden on you. In many, in serious cases, many believers with challenging backgrounds feel condemned or worthless. They taught to themselves in these sort of judgments. And mind you, I spent years as all kinds of bizarre things. Most of you have heard my story. I used to be a devil worshiper. I used to be involved in all kinds of stuff. And I could walk around all day and, you know, beat myself up and take lashes and whip myself on, oh, I'm so unworthy, I'm, I sold my soul to the devil, oh, I'm so evil. No, that's totally pointless. We are a new creation. I tell people, Bill Sneblin died on June 22nd, 1984 at the foot of my bed, right in Dubuque, Iowa. And a new creation was born. And no longer, I don't live in Christ. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's, I'm not even that same person anymore. There's a world of difference, and listen to me, please, between feeling worthless and feeling unworthy. We're all unworthy. You know, we all are unworthy of the grace of God, but none of us are worthless. Many people from backgrounds of drug or alcohol abuse or cults or sexual sin or the occult keep seriously judging themselves. And here's a problem which I want to address briefly. Uh, even the practices of many of these 12-step recovery groups fall into this trap. Um, and many people don't realize that, that AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and its various sister groups originally was a Christian organization. It came out of what was called the Moral Rearmament Movement and the Oxford Movement. But they decided the two guys that, whose names escaped me, uh, Bill W. and Dr. Bob, I think it was, something like that. Anyhow, they decided to get rid of Jesus and just make it this kind of generic God thing. God as I understand it. They insist in all these groups that people stand up if they choose to speak and say, hello, my name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic. Aside from the word that the word alcoholic is not even in the Bible, you know, realize the person saying this is judging themselves right then and there with an unbiblical label, an unbiblical concept. It is one thing, and a very important thing, to confess to Yeshua that you have sinned through drunkenness or drug abuse or whatever and then repent. That's fine. But it's quite another thing to go through life attending these 12-step 12, 12 meetings where you verbalize constantly that you're an alcoholic, that you're a drug addict, and judge yourself continually and continually and continually. If you have thoughts or temptations about past sins, 
I'm sorry, if this kind of a person has thoughts and temptations about past sins, they beat themselves up and even question their own salvation. And this is not right. This is just not right. And, you know, here's the thing, just as an example. I used to be a cocaine addict. You, you wouldn't believe the amount of cocaine I was doing. When, when I got born again, just like that, I was completely de delivered of cocaine. I haven't used it since 1984. I mean, I don't know, it's like 25 years or something like that. And, you know, I don't even think about it. I mean, if someone waved a, a bag of it in front of my nose right now today, I wouldn't even, it wouldn't even bother me. And you know, I've never been to a narco, uh, nar Narcotics Anonymous meeting. I've never stood up in front of a bunch of people and said, my name is Bill, I'm an addict. Because I'm not. I'm a new creation. And when, I, when people say that kind of thing, you know, I'm a sex addict, I'm an alcoholic, whatever, they're judging themselves. And this is wrong because Yahweh God, who is the judge of the universe, has declared us righteous and acceptable in his sight. If we continue to judge ourselves like this, we just dig ourselves into a deeper hole because we're calling him a liar. This is just like any other sinful thought pattern. Don't beat yourself up even more when you do it. You know, I mean, that's the trouble. I mean, anytime you, you preach a message like this, there's always a danger. Oh, this is one more thing I got to worry about. And then they don't, you don't do it right. And then you get all condemned. No, 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 no condemnation. We understand we're all on a journey. We're all on a pilgrimage. And I'm still working on this. You know, the Lord showed me this a couple of years ago, and I'm still working on it. We're, none of us are perfect. None of us have to be perfect. Um... When you notice you're doing it, just rebuke it quietly and sincerely and ask the Almighty to forgive you. He will. That's the end of it. At first, it'll be hard to rid yourself of this kind of negative self-judgment. But keep reading the Bible and concentrate on verses which declare your standing and the righteousness of the Messiah. Feed your mind these positive things and gradually the old man's stuff will pass away. And trust me, this is true. The more you concentrate on him, the smaller your problems will become. Because remember, whatever you put your mind on grows bigger. It's just like for an example, if you, let's say you drop a hammer on your toe and all of a sudden that toe feels like it's your whole body. I mean, you know, it just throbs with pain and you forget about everything else, you know. Well, it's kind of like that. You're not just your toe, you're your whole body. And you're not just this one problem, whether you're a, a former drunk or a former drug addict or whatever. You are a new creation in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. So, you know, feed your mind these kind of positive thoughts, and the scriptures are full of them. There's more subtle forms of self-judgment as well. Now, I have a history of being clumsy. My wife will confirm that. When I trip when I drop something, I say to myself, oh, I'm Captain Klutz, or I'm so clumsy, or I'm so stupid. Now, my wife will stop me if she's standing there, and she'll gently rebuke me and say, don't say that. That's not true, and she is absolutely right to do that, because I'm judging myself now, admittedly, in a more minor way. But we do this kind of thing. But this is, le this is less serious, but we still need to guard our tongues and take every thought captive. Um... We, as Christians, we're more aware of this in terms of other people. We should not condemn it or, in effect, curse ourselves. See, if we say, you know, I'm clumsy or I'm whatever, or I can't, you know, get a job, this is like cursing ourselves, literally, because our words have power. When we speak forth these judgments, whether mild or severe, we are creating bitter roots which need to be pulled out by the Holy Spirit. Okay judging others. This can be just as bad and just as hard to stop. It may be more serious depending on the circumstances. Remember, the Lord tells us when we judge, so shall we be judged. If we are harsh, critical, or biting in our words or thoughts about others, that creates bitter roots. Remember, the key difference is between discerning others' actions and judging them. This can be a bit tricky at first because that seems to be a fine distinction. Um, we need to discern good from evil. We need to discern if another person we know appears to be doing bad things so we can avoid being sucked into their mess. 
That's scriptural. That's fine. But the Bible is clear, except for scriptural judges. We'll talk more about that in a minute. No believer is ever to judge another person. Now, realize in the days of Yeshua, in the days of the Bible, there is what was called a bet din. That's Hebrew. It means house of judgment. These were judges who were Levites, who were entrusted with judging matters in the Torah. By the time of Messiah, unfortunately, this had been corrupted into the Sanhedrin, which we see in the Gospels. Today, there is no such thing as a bet din. The closest thing would be a pastor or a pastoral team. Now, excuse me, pastors are required by Scripture to identify and judge members of their flock to at first privately rebuke them, according to Matthew 18. If necessary, they may have to publicly re rebuke someone, an unrepentant individual, and even perhaps cast them out in extreme cases. I mean, if you have a member in your flock who is doing something scandalous, like, you know, maybe they, they're embezzling money, maybe they're like Bernie Madoff, or maybe they're, they're whatever, whatever sin, and they won't stop it, you've got to tell, you know, either repent or get out. You know, and that's right out of Titus 3.10. And this is to perfect, protect, excuse me, the rest of the flock. Understand, though, that kind of judging is part of the mantle of pastoral authority. Ordinary believers do not judge others. If they do, they create bitter roots. A thoughtful consideration of this Bible truth reveals there are all sorts of possibilities for bitter roots in most believers. And here's just some samples. Children judging their parents. And let, me, let me just talk about this for a minute. Understand something. Little children, toddlers, even pre-verbal that can't even speak yet, make judgments in their little spirits about their parents. Let's say, for example, little baby Johnny needs his diaper changed. And he's, you know, he's crying or whatever, you know, like they do. And mom isn't right there, just Johnny on the spot to change the diaper. Well, in his spirit, he's saying, my mommy is mean and evil and cruel because I'm sitting here in this mess and, you know, whatever. You can get the, the gist of that. Or, or maybe they're hungry. Maybe they're crying for the bottle or whatever, and mommy isn't just right there or daddy isn't just right there. They make judgments about that, even though they haven't even learned how to speak yet. Though done in innocence. These can still cause bitter roots later and need to be renounced in a general way. No big deal. Here's another one. Siblings judging one another. Think of all the conflicts between brothers and sisters, some of which go back to young childhood. Now, I happen to be an only child, so I don't have any first-hand experience of this, but I've certainly counseled hundreds of people where, man, you want to talk about Cain and Abel. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, of stuff going on there. It's no wonder that so many siblings have conflicted relationships with their peers in the family. Parents judging children. Now, this is huge. Let me explain why. When you are in relational authority over someone, like a parent is with a child, judgment you speak over them can have incredible power. Certain kind of judgments can even be like curses. Say, for example, you see your little two-year-old or three-year-old trying to pound a round peg into a square hole with a little Fisher Price toy thing or whatever. And you say, what a dumb kid. That's a curse. You know, or, or I'm sure you've all heard stories of parents that say to their child at a later age, you'll never amount to anything. You're a worthless piece of trash. I don't know what, you know, all this kind of stuff. Or here's a big one. What a bad boy. What a bad girl. This stuff is really scary if you understood what was going on at that point in the spiritual realm. Even judgments which are spoken apart from the child or just thought about being without being spoken can have an impact more on the parent in this case than the child. But because of the, of the power in the spiritual hierarchy that a parent has over their offspring, this can do amazing harm to both parent and child. Okay. Spouses judging each other. This is another big one. Because spouses spend so much time with each other, it's inevitable, especially at first, when they're getting used to each other, you know, that they should harbor judgments against one another. 
This could be major or even minor stuff, like the wife getting upset because hubby leaves the toilet seat up or something like that. And depending on how you, you deal with this, this can create bitter roots which can begin to poison not just the individuals but the marriage. And because this kind of stuff is not taught, we have the same divorce rate in the church today as we do out in the world. Another one is believers judging another, each other, which I, I think that's pretty much self-explanatory. Another one is believers judging their pastor. This can be a big issue because there's a lot of people, I, I remember one of the first pastors I ever uh, sat under, he said a lot of Christians when they come home from church, they sit down and they have roast preacher for lunch. Oh, I don't like what that Christ said today. You know, and they, they criticize their pastor in front of the kids, up one side, down the other. Not good. There is a curse and a spirit of lethargy which can come from unjustly criticizing your pastor. Now, the flip side of that is pastors unrighteously judging their flocks. I had this one woman that we counseled, and um, she was in a big, huge church. I won't say the name or anything. And her pastor had done this teaching on tithing, which is always a thorny issue, and because uh, it involves money. And she had written a letter to the pastor, totally confidential, telling him she thought he was wrong about something. It doesn't matter what the exact issue was. Anyhow, now, now imagine this. Here's a church of like two or 300 people at least. And he called her out by name in front of the whole church on Sunday morning and chewed her out. Now that's serious. That's a grave sin. That's a grave abuse of pastoral authority. It's also a big, bitter root judgment. Uh, pastors who do this are rather like parents who judge their children. Because see, again, pastors have relational authority over their flock. The difference between righteous and unrighteous judgment on the part of pastors is a, kind of a different discussion which we don't have time to get, spend much more time on that because I imagine most of the people listening to this aren't pastors anyway. Perhaps that's something for a later time. Um, but these judgments can be of a serious nature or something more mild, but they can still cause bitter roots. Now, here's some examples. Suppose you come to church and you see a female member of the congregation who dresses in a way that you think is inappropriate or suggestive. Maybe her your, your skirt is too short. Maybe her blouse is too tight. Maybe she wears <gasps> makeup, you know, stuff like that. You judge her. You think in your heart that she's a tart or a loose woman. At the very least, you mentally rebuke her because she's causing others to stumble and have impure thoughts. Or here's another example. Let's say you see a new church convert, or maybe even someone who's never even been to your church before, a young man walking in, or a young woman who's wearing strange clothes, hairstyle, maybe they've got like a bolt through their nose or tattoos or whatever, and you immediately judge them as a weirdo or a pervert. This is not right. Those are grave sins. Less serious examples of this. Getting angry and judging other drivers on the road who do what you believe to be stupid. Hello? I'll tell you. I've had to stop doing this myself because the Lord has convicted me. I mean, you, you know, you have people doing things on the highway and, you know, we think that somehow just because we're in a car and they can't hear us, it's okay. Oh, you're, you know, you're dumb as a box of rocks or whatever. You know, you don't say stuff like that. Another thing is judging people who are sloppily dressed, uh, who don't have any quote-unquote fashion sense. Another one is judging people who are seriously overweight. Oh, that guy's just a pig, you know, whatever. No, no. Or judging homeless people as bums. You know, all of this, this is, this is not good. Now, these are not as serious as some of the other things, but because usually we don't actually go up to the person and say, you're a fat pig. But still, you're doing it in your heart. And remember what we said way back at the beginning, it's what goes on in your heart that's important. Now, this is actually a major problem with most believers, and I am among them. I am preaching to myself here, too. I'm not trying to bring you under condemnation. I just want to bring some light upon this issue. Most of us know this stuff is wrong, but we're so used to doing it. And, of course, we live in a culture 
which encourages it. I mean, think about it. I, I don't watch them, but I understand there are TV shows where people, you know, make fun of other people and how they dress and they try to make them to dress more stylish or that they make people lose weight, you know, or what. They don't make them in a sense of force them, but I mean, you get on this show and that's the deal. You know, you have to lose weight and stop being a fat pig, you know. And, you know, all of this is is encouraging this kind of thought mentality. You know, the funny thing is, if we lived like a thousand years ago, being fat was a status symbol because it meant you were well enough off that you could actually afford to eat three meals a day, man. You know, but now we've got a whole different thing and it's all, it's also relative. It's also subjective. See, our culture, we don't even know what's, what it's doing to us because we're like a fish swimming in water and the fish doesn't even know it's in the water because that's all the fish knows. What is critical to understand is this. If you have difficulties in your life, in the lives of your family, this could be a major open doorway, especially old, unrepented sins of judging your parents or self or family members. Bitter root judgments are one of several major reasons in our lives why people's very souls can wither. Now, you might say, preacher, that sounds kind of bizarre. But no, it's actually scriptural. It's actually true. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And 1 Thessalonians, this is part of Paul's final instructions to the church in Thessalonica. He says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, so comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient towards all men. Now, that word feeble-minded, unfortunately, it didn't mean like 400 years ago when the King James translators translated it, what it means today. Today, we think of it means someone that's a simpleton. But actually, it means someone who has a tiny soul. Think about that. The word in Greek is oligosukos which means tiny soul or little soul. And it's like, it's kind of like if you take a plant and put it in a little tiny pot, the roots get all bound up and what happens to the plant? It sort of, you know, just sort of withers away. And that's what happens to people's souls because these bitter root judgments are like a bond, a binding that's put upon their roots that they cannot grow, they cannot flourish. And please understand that a tremendous, a tremendous amount of emotional healing can be gained by dealing with this ministry. Um, now, let me just expand this for a moment. We often ask ourselves, why, why do people's marriages don't work out? Why, why are we having such a high divorce rate? Well, imagine if you had one person in a marriage, or whatever, both maybe, where one person has this sort of withered, truncated soul. I mean, a marriage, ideally, and I mean, I know we don't live in an ideal world, but a marriage is ideally between two authentic, whole human beings. If one of them is like an emotional midget, which is what we're really saying here, you can't have a marriage. Like it says, you know, you can't, two can't walk together if they are an equally yoked. It would be like having a, we all know what a yoke is. I don't know like the yoke on an egg, but like the yoke of an, two oxen. Imagine if you had a yoke where one side of the yoke had an ox and the other side of the yoke had a chihuahua. You wouldn't get a very good field plowed if that was the case, would you? And that, that's what many marriages are like when either one or both parties, and I'm not picking on chihuahuas, it's just a good illustration because they're teeny dogs. Um, where either one or both parties are like chihuahuas trying to go through and plow the field of life. And that doesn't work. And, and then we wonder why people don't, don't have good marriages, why people don't have good friendships, why people's lives are so lonely. It's because they're little souled. And the only way to change that is to deal with these bitter roots 
to let the, the healing waters of the Holy Spirit pour over them and to let these roots begin to be cleansed and to flourish so that the plant that is your soul and your mind and your spirit blossom. It's that simple. So much emotional healing can be gained from this kind of ministry. Such people find that they are much more able to love, to worship Yahweh God, and to get more joy out of their lives. That's another thing. I'll just briefly mention this. Sometimes people will come to us for counseling and they'll say, I just, I just can't worship God. Like I, I go to church and it doesn't matter even what kind of you know, church it might be. They might be one of these jumpy, upping, downy kinds, or they might be one where they just sing hymns, or it might be something more formal. And I say, I just can't get into worshiping God. My heart feels like it's dead. Bitter roots. Wounded spirit. That's why when we pray and have them be set free from that and repent of that, and then they go out, and again, I'm not expecting you're going you're gonna to just immediately go out and bam, never, never do a bitter root judgment again in your life, because that's not how the human mind works. That's not how the human heart works. But at least now you know you can walk on a certain path in a certain way. And you can do warfare against these things, like it says in the, the passage I read at the beginning here. Um, and then their heart can open up, and they can feel more joy. They can feel more worship towards the Almighty. And it's, it's, a, it's a total transformation in their lives. Now, some people, especially those who are trauma survivors, may also need to pray out whether or not maybe they have judged God for allowing them to be hurt. And this is a big thing. You know, I mean, uh, we've had so many people come and say, well, when I was a little kid, my uncle abused me. How could God have let that happen? That's a very serious question. And there's not really an easy, pat answer for that. There needs to be serious ministry there and prayer. Because ultimately the answer is, is that, as it were, there is a contract between us and the Almighty that he gives us free will. And that's because of that that we have the people doing bad stuff in the world today. Um, but there needs still to be ministry, and some people need to forgive God and repent of making bitter root judgments against the Almighty. Now, at the end of this, which is coming pretty soon, we're going to be giving a prayer of renunciation for this sin. And we'd recommend you're doing this if you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit to do so. And if you want a hard copy of it, you can certainly free feel to write us or email us, and that, again, will be at the end of this thing. Uh, and we'll send you a, a PDF file or whatever. Uh, finally, if you feel convicted about this, I would advise praying and asking the Holy Spirit um, to bring you up short when you speak or think things that are critical about those around you, whether your loved ones, whether your friends, or your strangers. And I'll tell you this much. We have had folks get an incredible amount of peace in their lives, joy, whatever you want to call it, from following these simple scriptural admonitions. And plus, your life just starts to blossom and you start to become more of what you really are in the Messiah. Okay, by way of closing, I am going to lead you through this simple prayer, which also should be on the screen as I'm doing it. And I would just, and it may be you need to do this for more than one person because very few of us get through our entire lives without, you know, having more than one person hurt us. So um, you may need to do this several times for different people. And you may, before you sit down to do this, you may want to make a list. You know, oh, you know, that guy and there's that guy and there's Uncle Fred and there's, you know, my mom and there's my dad, blah, 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 whatever. And then sit down in your, in your private prayer time and do this. Or if you feel the need, go to your pastor or, or whoever, a Christian worker, and, and do it. So anyhow, this is the prayer we recommend, and I want to I wanna give credit for this. Some, some of this material is based on a book by Edward Carath called I Will Give You Rest, which is a very good book if you want to really explore this further. The only reason I don't totally recommend it is it does use, you know, other Bible versions. Uh, but, but beyond that, it is an excellent resource if you want to deep further into this, dig further into this. 
but this is more or less based on his prayer that he recommends. So if you want to just follow after me, I'll just lead you through this prayer. Abba Father, I come before you in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. I realized that I have judged whomever, and I have made inside me a root of bitterness. I am sorry that I did this, and I don't want this awful thing in me anymore. And you say the name of the individual. I forgive you for whatever they did. You could say like, you know, Dad, I forgive you for making me feel like a fool when I missed the touchdown or whatever. Lord Yeshua, I ask you to forgive me for this root of bitterness. Forgive me for taking your place as my judge. I ask you to come into that place in me. Remove that ugly thing from me and wash me clean with your blood. Cleanse me in every place where that bitterness existed. I ask you to come into that place, to fill all those places with your presence and with your Holy Spirit. Yahweh God, I ask that you would bless and then name the individual in Yeshua's name. Amen. And I would recommend doing that, or some, again, it doesn't have to be precisely that, but something on that order if you feel led by the Holy Spirit that this is really something you feel you need to do. And um, basically, that's what I have for you today. Uh, again, if you have questions about this, um, our email and our mailing address is going to be provided at the end of the screen. And uh, we just we feel that this is something very revolutionary. We wrote 10 years ago or more now a book called Blood on the Doorpost which talks about how to be set free from the realm of darkness. This takes it to the next level, where not only are you free from the darkness, but you're also free from your own emotional bondage. So we, we exhort you to take this stuff seriously. I pray it's been a blessing to you. And may Yahweh rich you, richly bless you as you seek to grow in Him. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.